welcome to today's edition of Frightfully Forgotten. But first of all, what are we drinking today? We're drinking Drag Me to Hellas. Mm. Feel like hell the next day. <laughs> yeah, feel like hellas. <laughs> today we are doing, as promised, The Exorcist 3 Legion. Yeah. The full-on retrospective review, as opposed to just our little VHS tale we did last week. It is written and directed by William Peter Blatty, who wrote the novel that the first movie was based on. He's also directed some movies too, Ninth Configuration, based off of the novel Legion, which he wrote, which is the proper direct sequel to The Exorcist. It is starring... George C. Scott is in one of the best haunting movies ever, which we covered, called The Changeling. Brad Dourif is also in this. He, of course, is the voice of Chucky in the Child's Play movies. It starts with a dark, eerie, windy atmosphere with leaves blowing around. We see Kinderman, and uh, he's on a dock investigating the murder of a 12-year-old boy. He was crucified to rowing oars steel spikes driven through his eyes. He was decapitated in the place of his head, a statue of Jesus. And the statue's face was done up in like blackface. Not only is he defiling the body, he's defiling the kid's race. Yeah. It turns out that he is very good friends with a priest named Father Dyer. And he is from the first movie. They're trying to cheer each other up because it's the anniversary of that night where Father Karras died. It cuts to a scene of a priest in a confessional. All you see is blackness, but you hear a woman's voice on the other side and she's like, it's very dark and creepy. First victim was in Candlestick Park. And it cuts to the priest's face and it's just a look of horror. You see a bit of blood kind of running down the floor and so you know what happened. It shows Kinderman uncovers the uh, the veil that's covering the priest's body and he notices that there's a finger missing on one hand. On the other hand, there's a sign of the Gemini. He's starting to link this stuff to the Gemini killer, which was 17 years ago. The Gemini killer was apparently caught and executed. Kinderman begins talking to this Dr. Temple who is super chain-smoking <laughs> yeah. the whole time. As soon as he finishes a cigarette, he <laughs> lights up another one like right away. He happens to tell Kinderman about the story about this patient they found who's in the psych ward who was catatonic up until when the murders started. They had found him 17 years ago wandering the streets with amnesia dressed like a priest. This patient intrigues Kinderman. Kinderman goes down to cell 11. Who does it resemble? Who does it look exactly like? Who is this person? It is Damien Karras from the first movie, <laughs> yeah. who had supposedly died after being thrown out of a window, down a flight of stairs, <laughs> and buried. And he is in this cell in a straitjacket, just woken up from a catatonic state. Dead people don't just move around and talk. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean, Rick and Morty? Yes. <laughs> so if you want to find out what happens with Damien Karras, Kinderman, and the Gemini Killer, keep watching Exorcist 3 Legion. It's a fantastic sequel. It's a true, real yeah. sequel to the first one. A lot of sequels is like, well, I saw this one already. It was called the first one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one is, in a way, it's completely different. The only reason it's called the Exorcist three is because some characters carry over into this story. That's the only real connection to the first one. There is an exorcism that happens at the end. <laughs> right, but that was because of the studio. But that's and... because of the studio and <laughs> insisted on having an exorcism in this movie. It feels like the exorcist. Exactly. It, it, it feels like you're in the same city with the same atmosphere and the same characters right even though different actors play the characters mm -hmm. he use a lot of the scary church imagery that they used in the first one as well and they actually i think in this movie they do a better job at making the statues and the interior of the church look not just scary but almost like threatening yeah they make the church out to be a place that you don't want to go yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah not only is the church a scary setting in the hospital of course there's a psychiatric ward 
And can you get much scarier than yeah. a psychiatric ward where it's cold and sterile and mm -hmm. these crazy people everywhere? And then he goes to visit all the old people on that one floor. Old people who have lost their mind are scary. Yeah, they're all grabbing at yeah, you. It's, it's, and... it's, every setting that Kinderman is put in is uncomfortable and creepy. The settings of this movie are chosen for a great reason because it just right. puts you off. You, you feel unsettled. George C. Scott does a good job of portraying how unsettling oh, everything is, right? Brad Dourif is in this, and we haven't even touched on his character at all in the plot or anything yet. It's one of his best performances. He just grips you in. You can't take your eyes off this man. There was a lot that was shot with Brad Dourif that was never used in the movie because they cut mm -hmm. all that stuff in with the Damien Karras. Dialogue is so deep. It's like you're watching a play. Directed and written by the same person who wrote the novel. Like, it's very wordy. The dialogue <laughs> in this movie is outstanding. It's great dialogue. It's some of the best dialogue, I think, written for a movie. Genuine dialogue between characters. Yeah. And not only a genuine dialogue, a genuine psychological thriller mm -hmm. that doesn't use gore and bl blood and, and, and the actual act of seeing a murder happen to scare you. It's right. all the aftermath. It's all the description. You never see the boy who's crucified to the oars. Kinderman is speaking to Dyer about it in the bar. Mm -hmm. And just the description and the way he talks about it. That's the scary part. Not seeing it. Yeah. It's him describing it to another man. And a lot of the scenes were actually cut that showed the aftermath of the murders. The priest in the confessional booth is holding his own head, basically. But they cut that out. And it's actually better. Yeah. Because... You, they describe it. They show just before the people die all the time in this movie. Yeah. They never actually show a killing. Which leads us to what everyone wants us to talk about <clears throat> is yeah. the infamous jump scare. Some people say it's the best jump scare in horror movie history. I kind of think so. It might be. <laughs> it's sort of that, that infamous double climax. There's a nurse in the hospital. She hears something. And she goes to go check up on a patient. One angle down the <laughs> hallway. She walks into the room and you can see in the room there's some curtains kind of flowing a little bit from the wind or whatever. And it's like, oh, what's behind that? There's a sound that happens and she looks and it's a glass. And this ice slowly melting in glass causes a sound. She's like, oh, oh, that was it, right? <laughs> she reaches for the glass. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get any sleep here? Poor patient who's, yeah. pissed, you know, he got pissed off. He got woken up by a nurse. And then it cuts to the hallway again, peering down to where there's an elevator in the back and the nurse station. This shot is continuous. There's no cuts. Yeah, which is rare again, yeah. right? It's and very it's what rare. makes it work very well. And there's so many little things happening in there. And there's a cop that comes in at one point and he sits down. And it's, it's again very subtly you think, oh, okay, yeah, the cops and, there, nothing's gonna happen. The cop is there, you know. Yeah. And then nurse gets up and she goes to a different room to check on something, and another cop comes and gets that cop, and they leave <laughs> yeah. together. Like, oh, okay, she's by herself now. Then the cop comes and the back. Cop comes <laughs> back, and you're like, oh, okay, well, the cop is there. I guess you know, she's kind of safe. Then the cop leaves again, and like. Just seconds later, she comes out of the room, and then... That's your second yeah. scare, right? And, and again, you don't see the murder happen. The time that takes place between the first jump scare and the second one, I think, is what makes it work so well, because a lot of jump scares, you know, the cat comes out... Meow! Huh! And then, oh. then blah, 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 yeah. you know, it's it's seconds away. The the next jump scare is seconds away, but this is like minutes away. Yeah, you've already calmed down from the first scare, yeah. right? I had forgotten all about the first jump scare part. It scared the living shit out of me that yeah. first one. It's like holy fuck. So it worked on me. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I was my heart was beating, and then it calmed right down. I was like, okay, I know something's coming, but. When now? Yeah. I can't quite remember. Yeah. And I was calm, and then ding! Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, it's perfect. Yeah. And that image gets burned in your brain of that... That white gown. That white gown figure. The murders are very inventive. It, it, 
this guy or this this person took their time, right? All the murders are done to sort of almost defile the church as well, right? Yeah. And to kind of throw it in the church's face. This movie had a lot of cuts made to it due to the studio. There was an alternate opening. There was an alternate ending. The movie never actually had the actor who plays Damien Karras in it originally. Yeah. Which would have made it more confusing. And there is an alternate version of the movie out there called Legion, which is kind of more of the director's cut. But I'm not glad they put in the forced studio exorcism. <laughs> it's all ridiculous. Like the priest comes in to exercise Damien Karras and he gets all thrown onto the ceiling yeah, yeah. and like sticks to the ceiling and peels off. And this, like, the floor all comes out <laughs> and all the hell's <laughs> coming out of the floor. and <laughs> the, the Bible all blows yeah. up. Like, <laughs> you can oh, tell. Come on. You can tell where Hollywood is like, they yeah. put their finger on that one, right? <laughs> this movie does follow the book, like, very close. Very close. You read it. Yeah, I just read it. Yeah, I, I didn't just... read it. <laughs> Cinematically, it does everything a horror movie should do. It really gets under your skin. It builds tension so well. It's a very psychological in a way, too, because you don't know what Kinderman, when he's in the cell with Patient X, was what he's seeing real? Like it'll, you don't know. I like that question that you keep asking yourself. What is he really seeing? Who is he really talking to? Mm -hmm. Can't sleep after watching <laughs> this movie. Go out and play some baseball. Or something. <laughs> Run a few laps yeah. or something. Or drink a few beers. Yeah. Pass out. So if you want a movie that's a true sequel to The Exorcist, one of the best sequels out there, please check out The Exorcist 3. It is one of the best mind fucks <laughs> ever uh, and scariest movies you'll see. Keep drinking.